And before we go anywhere else, I just want to say that yesterday I made one of the cardinal parenting errors that you can make. I have four kids at home, uh, ages 10, that's my oldest, all the way down to two. And yesterday afternoon, I can't believe it, I went to the grocery store and I did not get milk. (laughs) So this morning, I, in candy cane pajama pants, went to Turkey Hill down the street in order to pay $5.20 a gallon to get milk. I say that to say this, despite the appearance I'm a man of the people, I understand the struggles that many of us live with day in and day out, and so we're going to open up God's Word together, and we're going to see what it has to say for us. Let me pray. Father God, we want to dedicate this time to you. You've given us your Word, and yet you've also said that through your Spirit we can understand it effectively, and that's what I want to ask for. I want to ask that as we look in it, that even though my mouth is making words, that you working through the preparation process that has already been engaged in, but more importantly, through this moment here right now, would help us to see what we need to see and hear what we need to hear so that our lives might better line up with understanding who you are and who you've created us to be and how much you love us and what that means. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this morning, uh, if you're taking notes, you have a program. It looks like this, and I'm going to actually give you the answers to the test right off the bat. We're going to remove all the test anxiety, so pull those out, and we're going to fill in the blanks that we have here, and then we will talk about why. But I have found that that can be really helpful, so that's the way we're going to do it here this morning. So big idea number one that we're going to try to tackle this morning and we're going to see as we open up this part of God's word is this. Faith is not the absence, that's the first word, faith is not the absence of doubt or failure. Instead, it is a choice to persevere in spite of them. All right, faith is not the absence of doubt or failure, it is a choice to persevere in spite of them. And nobody's going to see how you spell it, so spell it however you want, okay? All right. The the next thing that we're going to look at, it says this. The evidence of our faith shines most brightly through our above and beyond. If you use the little, like, and symbol instead of the word, it can fit. I, I did it myself. Shines most brightly through our above and beyond and unexpected actions. The evidence of our faith shines most brightly through our above and beyond and unexpected actions. And finally, big idea number two, pretending is never going to help you grow. Pretending is never going to help you grow, and God has never asked you to do it. God has never asked us to pretend. It won't help us grow. God's never asked us to pretend. All right, so we're going to catch up and root ourselves in our series. Where have we been so far? We're, we're several weeks now into looking at the life of Abraham. And if you're here for the first time, what we've been finding in the life of Abraham is that this is a guy who uh, at some point has this really big faith that leads him and his family to do courageous and sacrificial things. And at other points, fear and worry just kind of masters him. And he makes mistakes and he acts in kind of cowardice. And and it's just this strange back and forth. We know that Abraham wasn't perfect, right? He made mistakes over and over again. He's at times mastered by fear and worry, like I just said, and at times he lacked personal discipline. Some of the examples, right, we looked in previous weeks at Abraham in Egypt, right? And you remember Abraham in Egypt was afraid because his wife was too good looking. You remember that if you were here, right? So Abraham's wife was beautiful. That's what the Bible tells us. And he was worried because in the culture of the Egyptians, you could kill somebody to take something that you wanted from them. And he was like, I think somebody might want this beautiful wife of mine. So let's, babe, just pretend that you're my sister. Right? That's what he did. And it turns out it caused problems. We talked about that already. Another example is that God questions a promise 
that Abraham gave to him. And it's a pretty central promise to the Abraham story, right? It's a promise that God is going to make him the father of many nations, right? So God appears to a man who's advanced in age and says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. His wife at that point was advanced in age. So that kind of brings up the like, wait, how's this going to work? Does that make sense? It makes up a how's it going to work kind of conundrum. And so Abraham's like, I don't know if I believe this, right? And we talked about this whole thing where God made a covenant with him. And Pastor Dustin walked us through this whole thing of where they, God said, bring a three-year-old cow, bring a three-year-old goat, bring a ram, bring a dove, bring a pigeon, and we're going to make a sacrifice, right? And it was a little bit gruesome, right? But, but we learned that in that time period, what they would do, and this is something that would happen when like kings and leaders of different places would make a covenant with each other. They would take the sacrifice, they would cut those animals down the middle, and they would spread the, the pieces apart, and both parties would walk through the pieces. And that was their way of symbolizing that we are entering into this covenant together, Right, we also saw that Abraham, uh, Abram and Sarai, his wife, they kind of took matters into their own hands about how to have a kid. And Sarai, in what was a culturally appropriate thing to do, but was outside of what God had said to them, said, why don't you take my servant and have a child? Oh, is that me? Am I bumping? Why don't you take my servant and have a child with her since I can't give you one? Right? And that was the servant, Hagar. That's what we talked about last week. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 17 and a little bit into chapter 18. So go ahead and open up your Bibles if you have them. And we're going to read some of the passage, and then we're going to, I'm just going to try to help us understand culturally maybe some things that help us get what we need to get from this. And then we'll keep reading, and we'll stop a little bit, and we'll keep reading. So here we go. I apologize, this is smaller than I thought that it would be, so hopefully you can follow along in your Bibles if you need to. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Pause. Have we heard this before? Yeah, we've heard this one before, right? God keeps coming back and meeting Abraham where he's at, and he is renewing this covenant right now here in this moment. As for me, God talking, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God." So there's a lot there to unpack. Let's put this in some perspective. All right, so Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran with his wife Sarai. Right, that was kind of the beginning of our series. But we know that from Genesis chapter 12. He was 75 years old. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. And here, right now, Abraham is 99 years old when God appeared to him and reminded him of the terms of their covenant and added some new details. That's what we just read. 99 years old. The things that he added to the covenant were these new names, right? Now we don't have Abram, we have Abraham, and we don't have Sarai, we have Sarah. He also added this idea of circumcision, which is a visible sign of a commitment. All right, if you're a young person in the room and you don't know what circumcision is, I would love for you to ask your parents after this. <laughs> and we're just going to handle it that way. But here's the reality. I'm going to summarize for a moment the next section of Genesis 17, 9 through 14, simply by saying this. 
in Scripture, we find many, many times that God is a God who uses visible symbols to indicate something really important or some sort of commitment. All right? And in this case, the idea of circumcision was that physical sign of commitment that he was asking for from his people. Right? To understand this, now today, circumcision is something that's really primarily done for health reasons, if it's done at all. And there's a lot of dispute about whether it's necessary or not. So we're talking about a totally different thing back then. I would liken it to this. I know some people, and I think it's cool who go out and get brother and sister tattoos. Anybody ever heard that? Or friend tattoos, right? Where you get like half a heart on your wrist here and they get half a heart on their wrist here. So when you put them together, it makes a whole heart, right? It's cute. So that's the idea is that somebody makes a choice to do something permanent to their body that is a visible sign of a connection or a commitment. Does that make sense? That's what we're talking about here. So we're not held to the same thing today, but that was an important part of the process for the Israelites back in Abraham's day. So then we're going to pick up the story at verse 15. All right, so if you're in your Bibles, we're picking it up at verse 15. And I want to say before we go there, this is really critical. We got to humanize people in the Bible. Sometimes we read it and we don't recognize that this is a historical account of real people having real struggles. And Abraham and Sarah's story is one that says God made a promise when Abraham was 75 years old and he waited 25 years for the child that was promised. How many of you are like, man, it's been three days that I was waiting on my Amazon package and I have Prime, so it was supposed to be here yesterday, right? We don't wait very well for things. It was 11 years after the promise before Sarah or Sarai said, hey, maybe I could help God out a little bit. Maybe God wanted to do it this way, so let's do it this way. We can kind of understand a little more if we put it into perspective, right? All right, let's pick up the story. In verse 15, God also said to Abraham, so this is after he's explained the whole circumcision covenant thing. He said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down and he laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God says, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for your son Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. And when he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. So there's a few things that we need to tackle here. And one, the first one is this, name changes. Names are really important to God. And I'm going to try to go through this kind of quickly. But here's what we find. Abram, as we look at it linguistically in Hebrew, it means the father of many. Abraham is similar but different. And the main difference is that it means father of many nations. All right, so it's almost like God is doubling down on this promise. And that one thing that a scholar mentioned as I was studying to prepare for this that I thought was, was really important is he talked about how back in this culture, names were used a lot more for their utilitarian value, right? Today, I just call you by the name that you say you are, and that's how I get your attention, right? But back then, there was a lot more of an understanding of what each person's name meant, and people selected those names very, very intentionally. And so he pointed out, this man, Abram, had a name that said father of many, and he was childless. Think of how many social interactions might have gone weird based off of that, 
right? Oh, you're Abram. How many kids do you have? Well, I have a promise, right? I, mean, I don't know how he handled that, but, but those probably, that probably made it worse trying to wait, trying to believe that what God said was going to come true. Now, Sarai's a little bit trickier, so here's what I found. Sarai as a name means my princess or my queen, depending on who you look at. One of the things that was noted about that name is that it is possessive, right? So when you say my princess, that's not like me as a dad talking to my two-year-old daughter and saying, oh, my princess. It's more like somebody saying, this is my princess, right? There's a possessive component to it. They also said that this is disputed, but it's possible that this name held a connection to the pagan worship of a moon. I think I wrote mood. Oops. It's supposed to be moon deity of the Akkadian Empire. So the Akkadian Empire, we don't have time to talk about it today, but it's not the Roman Empire. It's a different empire. And this empire was operational around the time of Abraham in the same area around Mesopotamia. There's some cool things if you're into history that you can read about them. But the point is, Sarai as a name held some connotations that might not have been super great. Sarah, in Hebrew, as near as we can translate it, means strong princess. And there's a distinction that was noted by scholars that it no longer holds that possessive component. It's no longer somebody saying, this is my princess or my queen. And instead, she's independent of being possessed by anyone but herself. There's a translation component to it that could mean princess of a multitude, right? So you see where God has changed the names to reflect this vision of you're not just going to have a lot of kids and they're going to have kids. You're going to turn into nations with kings and rulers and they're all going to trace their lineage to you. And we have seen that in history. God uses names prophetically. So we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to run through a couple. We will find out, if you read on in Genesis, right around chapter 32, you're going to see where one of Abraham's descendants named Jacob has his name changed. Anybody know what Jacob's name was changed to? Israel. Yeah, that's good. And that's certainly current in our news right now, right? This whole thing is current in our news right now. Another one in the book of Mark, we see that there was a man named Simon, and Simon's name was changed to, anybody know? Peter. Peter. That's right. You guys are smart. Interestingly enough, there's another name that you might think of in Scripture, Saul and Paul, but actually that wasn't a name change. I was surprised when I was studying to learn. You can go to the book of Acts and see that God grabbed a hold of Saul on the road to Damascus, right? Some of us have heard that story. He blinds him. He's blind for three days. He shows up. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me, right? In my mind, I thought that his name changed to Paul when his eyes were open and he started serving God after that. And it turns out he actually is referred to by many, many people for several chapters as Saul. What's true is that Paul, or Saul, was born as a Roman citizen as well as being a Hebrew individual. Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul was the name that he was given as being born a Roman citizen. And so there's a point in the in the book of Acts, where it became very practically helpful for him to start going by his Roman citizen name. And then for the rest of the recorded history and scripture, you see him as Paul rather than Saul. That's for free. It's just interesting. All right. So back to the point. Even us, some of the names that we see in scripture, God calls his people saints. He calls us righteous ones. He calls us chosen he calls us the royal priesthood. He calls us sons and daughters, heirs to the kingdom. And the whole point of this is that names matter to God. And what we see is that they are an indication of what God is in the process of accomplishing or what he will accomplish as we move forward. There's even, you can look in Revelation chapter 2. There's a place that says that every one of us who's a believer, it says to the one who overcomes, right? And the idea behind that is you live your life, you're committed to Christ, you have overcome. And by the time you see him someday, it says God will give a new name to everyone who overcomes and perseveres to the end. And it actually says that it's a new and secret name that's written on a white stone. So you got a name coming that's different than the name that you have. I've got a name coming that's different than the one that I have. 
All right, so back to the story. We're going to do another quick summary just for the sake of time. Genesis 17, 23 through 27 is simply Abraham following through on his end of the bargain, right? It says that on that day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all the males born into his household or bought or brought in, and he circumcised them. It says Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his son Ishmael was 13. So it was a bro trip, right? Now, last summer, I got to go to Six Flags with my 10-year-old. Different kind of bro trip. But what I would say is oftentimes we look in Scripture and we think, man, it'd be so cool to live back then when all these miracles are happening and see all these things. Well, the truth is there's probably some times where it's a little better to live now than it was back then. All right, and that's all the time we're going to spend on that. So we're picking things up now. And we're jumping ahead to Genesis 18, 1 through 15. You with me? All right. So Genesis 18, chapter, verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham, new name, near the great trees of Mamre. While he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Some translations will say three strangers. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. They're in the desert right now. You know what it is in the middle of the day in the desert? Extremely hot. Yeah. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed, and then you can go on your way now that you've come to your servant. Very well, they said, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Anybody baked bread? This is not a fast process that we're talking about right now, right? So the idea is that that Abraham is practicing hospitality to three people he doesn't know who happened upon them in the desert. He plans for them to stay a little while, to cool off. He wants to feed them, right? Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set all of these before them. While they ate, he stood near, he stood near them under a tree. And they asked him, where's your wife, Sarah? Over there in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent. I love that because that's what I do. (laughs) I like to eavesdrop, and I try not to sometimes. But when I read this, I'm like, oh, man, I can see myself in this story. Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind them. Abram and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied, and she said, I didn't laugh. And he said, Yeah, you did laugh. (laughs) Right? So a couple things that we can feel confident in in this part of the story. One of the things we can feel confident in is that this part of the story happened very, very closely after the last part of the story. The last part of the story, the Lord said to Abraham, in one year's time, you're going to have Isaac. And now, all of a sudden, we have this like literary device where we get some information through the writing of the person who recorded this that they didn't have right away, which is right at the beginning, I think I can back up, who appeared to Abraham? The Lord, right? Abraham didn't know that as far as we can tell. Abraham saw three people walking through the desert that he didn't know. But you can kind of tell as this story or this part of the story unfolds, they kind of get it, right? They're like, oh man, this person knows some stuff. And you can tell that their demeanor changes a little bit. So one of the interesting things about Scripture, and I wish we had more time to develop it, but this is what we can believe about this passage. Most scholars believe that it was actually Jesus 
who appeared to Abraham and Isaac in this moment. And here's the reason why. There's different places in the Old Testament that have this language that says, the Lord appeared to this person or did this thing with that person. And what we know from Scripture, I just picked out two passages, but there's a couple other ones, and I'm going to read them to you. In John 1.18, it says, no one has seen God at any time. In 1 Timothy 6.16, it says, God dwells in unapproachable light no man has seen or can see. So we have this interesting conundrum that takes place where we have these passages in the Old Testament that say the Lord appeared to somebody, and we have these other parts in Scripture that make a clear distinction that God, and in linguistically we're looking at God the Father, has not been seen by anyone. Right? So what we can reasonably conclude from that, and what most scholars who have developed this argument way more than I have the time to do now, so I'm asking you to trust me a little bit, is that in these parts in the Old Testament, we see that Jesus, as a person of the Trinity, was actually working with and for God the Father in the lives of people well before he came to the earth as a baby. So Jesus is engaged in this story with Abraham and Sarah. Jesus is the one who keeps coming back to them and encouraging them and saying, you're part of a plan, you're still part of the plan, right? And even here, we need to look at this idea of laughter. Genesis 17, 17, we already read it, I just wanted you to see it. Abraham fell face down and he laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Sarah, hiding in the tent, eavesdropping on the conversation, laughs to herself, am I going to get to experience this pleasure this late? In life. Just in case there's any confusion, I appreciate the New Living Translation here. The New Living Translation actually says, Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. So you see what's going on, right? They're struggling. Abraham and Sarah believe God, but they're also having a really hard time believing God. Anybody been there? That's the thing that I want us to be encouraged about this morning, is that if you're there, that's okay. In Mark 9, we, this is what I thought of when I think of the story of Abraham. In Mark 9, we see a, a passage where there's a father who has a son who has been demon-possessed since early, early childhood. Basically, as long as he's been alive is how the father describes it. And for a long time, he's had to try to care for his son when this demon will do all kinds of horrible things to the body of his child. And so he takes his child to Jesus' disciples. They can't do anything for him. And so he finds his way to Jesus. And he says, I forgot how I put it in here. This is what he says. If you can do anything, please help us. And Jesus responds, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cries out, I do believe, but please help me overcome my unbelief. Boy, do I see myself in this story. And maybe some of you do too. And my fear is oftentimes when we hit a place in life where we're barely holding on and we're like, I I know God is real, I know this is true, but I don't feel it right now. It's not doing anything emotionally for me. Like, I just feel checked out and I have such a hard time believing he's going to do the things he's told me. Abraham and Sarah were the same way, right? And this is the encouragement that we find. In Romans chapter 4, This is Paul talking about Abraham and Sarah and their story to the believers in Rome. He says, Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. And the next part of that passage is for us. The words, it was credited to him, this is Paul talking, it's right there in scripture, look yourself. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for those of us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
The encouragement that comes from the story of Abraham and Sarah is that that doesn't have to look like always doing the right thing for your faith to be a faith that leads to righteousness. For me, I need that encouragement. I have some dark moments. And in fact, what I'm going to do, if you're watching on live stream, I have to give a disclaimer because I don't preach very often. And I picked out a three-minute video clip. And it turns out that three-minute video clip has the potential to flag our live stream and kick it off. So, unfortunately, live stream, I don't know which camera to look at. I apologize. We're going to go dark for about three minutes. And then we're going to come back. And in the meantime, we're going to watch this story that I think, when I first saw it, really shows the Christian faith in a way that I needed to see it. I wish I had more time to talk about how much that clip meant to me the first time I saw it. And I wish I had more time to tell you about the fact that through my life, I love God and I've tried to follow him. And there's been moments of time, there are still moments of times, where I get hit with these intrusive thoughts that are very difficult to handle. And they don't feel very Christian. And so the story of Abraham and Sarah, it encourages me and I hope it encourages you because the truth of the matter is they kept coming back to God. It is not the perfection. It is the fact that every time they slipped up, every time they they took matters into their own hands, once they realized it, they came back to God's promise. They came back to God's heart. And so our last big idea that we're going to end with, and then I'm going to pray and the band's going to come up, is that pretending will never help you to grow. I hope you know this is a church where you don't have to pretend like it always feels good. This is a church where it's okay to say, my life is falling apart and I have no idea what to do about it. And sometimes it's just simply, what is the next thing I can do I talked to somebody this morning who reminded me. It's not even about just what do I do today. Sometimes it's what do I do in the next five minutes? What do I do for the next 10 seconds? And that's okay. God's with us. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the story of Abraham and Sarah and just what an encouragement it can be. How much it breaks us out of this maybe societal or cultural view that says if I'm a Christian that I need to act like it always feels right or that I'm always just so in love with you and that it's never hard. God, you've always told us that we can bring ourselves exactly as we are because you already know it anyway. And you love us the same in our darkest moments as you do in our brightest. And we love you for that. And may we be a church where we can talk about those things openly and encourage one another. It's in your son Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen.